Okay, you can all come in. Good evening. Uh, I'm just going to say the title of tonight's message, and we'll probably, like Pastor Shallow, will say some things to set it up with Pastor Stevens, what Pastor Stevens has to say tonight. So the name of the message tonight, number 5421 in the Sermon Archive. Wait for it. It's the love road to relationships. All right, don't get so excited. It's, a, it's actually, it's, a, it's not as spicy as maybe the title. It's like, but, uh, you know, we remember, Pastor Schaller and I can remember, like, Pastor Stevens, like, fixing people up from the pulpit and, like, you know, actually saying, you should marry her. And there is one couple in Maine that it happened and it worked. So, uh, the Moorheads, right? The Moorheads, remember the Moorheads? Hey, Frank. And Elaine, if you're watching, uh, we're shouting out to you. <laughs> they might be watching online up in Maine uh, if they're not too snowed under up there. But, uh, you know, maybe because they are snowed under, they're watching that. So, love road to relationships. Uh, Pastor Matt, I see you have a paper. Do you have something to say? No? Okay. Or nothing official? Okay. You look kind of official standing there. Everyone give Pastor Matt a hand. He's got some. Yeah. Yeah. So you got you, you drove him out of the room. That's a, yeah. we're loving. This is a relationship of love that we're having with the director of the Bible College. It's amazing. All right. So uh, all right. So uh, just maybe for a second, a couple minutes before Pastor Schaller comes up, think about like that word. That's a big word, like relationships. Like what you know what I know the obvious obvious thing that you might think about, but talk to some, relate to somebody. Here you go. We're going to encourage you to relate to someone right now, someone near you. You guys are married, so maybe you, know, you guys are, you guys are all related somehow because you're Finnish. So, but maybe you should talk to somebody else there. Okay. All right. Go ahead. Two minutes and then uh, Pastor Shallow will introduce the thing and then we'll listen to Pastor Stevens. Okay, uh, <clears throat> good evening everyone and so good to be together and listening to the word and uh, how many of you could say that I really need to hear something tonight that's going to build me up and love me and encourage me, how about it, huh? Yeah. All right, uh, turn to your neighbor and just, just say let's pray for that to happen tonight. It doesn't look too good for you. But let's pray to God that he'll help us. Amen. Go ahead. Have a prayer with your neighbor. Lord Jesus, we pray for our class to just speak by your Spirit to our hearts and prepare us, Lord, in life. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, turn with me to John. So we have, uh, we have two parts to this hour. Uh, the, my portion, like now, just like 10 minutes or 15, just kind of warm up and get the idea about relationships. And then we have the video, which is about 30 minutes, I think, or 40. 
30 minutes, then we'll do the break and then come back and do the second part of the class. All right, so John 6, 26. Yeah, and the context is the feeding of the multitude. We have 5,000 people that are fed miraculously, and um, they eat, and they are amazed at the miracle, the miracle-working Jesus. And this man can feed us uh, free of charge. A miracle happens. It's easy for me to say, I want Jesus in my life. I want Jesus in my life. Jesus might make me rich. Jesus may feed me lunch. Jesus may heal my body. Jesus may give me a good husband or a good wife. Jesus may make my life successful. So that's very easy to like think about Jesus. After you have been fed, 5,000 people all talking with each other and saying, how did this happen? So I want to help you understand the context. There's the house, you know, this house that we draw about with the universe. We say on the first house, first house, first floor of the house, we have uh, life as we know it. And um, in this case, we have food. And the people follow Jesus. And Jesus says to them, the reason you're following me is because I fed you. So let's read John 6, verse 26. Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, you seek me not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. All right. Uh, I said it was because I saw the miracles, but I'm corrected there. But I, I think you can follow the thought. You are drawn to the food. Okay. Now, this is, this is very normal that we would be drawn to. You have Jesus plus my need, and he meets my need, and then I miss the bigger thing. I miss the bigger thing, and that is a relationship with Jesus. So when we go to the bigger thing, we go to the next level of the house, and we find we know who God is. We, we find Christ in a personal relationship. We find Christ as, as the answer for my life. Okay? Yeah, I, for, let's read the text. Chapter 6, verse 27. Labor not for the meat which perishes, but for that meat which endures unto everlasting life which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. Do you get it? I bet you do. I bet you you got it. I bet you got it. Joey, you got it? You got it? Okay. Just, yeah, I got it. You got it? All right. It's very profound. It's very profound. I got a, a little book here. Paul David Tripp called Marriage. And he tells a story in here uh, about a counseling case. I once was talking with a lady who had been married many years. She was married to a person who very honestly was a very bad man. He was angry, controlling, and manipulative. He said and did hurtful things. She had dreamed of the ultimate husband, but she certainly hadn't gotten him. Now she was so embittered by the blessings of other women in her church. They enjoyed, uh, in, the, in her church enjoyed, by the blessings other women in her church enjoyed, that she said she could no longer go to church. She felt as if God had forsaken her so much so that she couldn't read her Bible or pray. As I listened, I wanted her to understand her identity in Christ. I wanted her to know the love of the Lord, that God is a refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. So I started reading her passages that spoke of the amazing, abundant 
love of God. And in the middle of a verse, she said, stop. Don't tell me again that God loves me. I want a husband who loves me. And she pounded her fist on her chair as she said it. Her dream had definitely crumbled. What were her options? How would Jesus want her to respond in her situation? Let's answer that question by looking at ourselves. If your dream were to dissolve in front of your eyes, how would you react? Let's be honest. Would you fall into self-pity? Would you lash out in blame? Get swallowed up by envy and covetousness? Doubt the goodness of God? Find it hard to read the Bible, to pray, to fellowship, to worship? These kinds of responses reveal that you are living for earthly bread. How can we be different? Scripture gives us a rich example in the book of Habakkuk. <clears throat> so I think maybe in the second hour of the class we'll look at the book of Habakkuk. But here, follow it with me. Where was the woman living when she's saying, I want a good husband? Where was she living in our diagram? Yeah, first floor of the house. I think Jesus would give me a good husband. I think Jesus would make my life like this. I think Jesus would give me a long life. I think Jesus would do this and so on. You know, you get the idea. And then Jesus said, labor, not for the bread that perishes, but for it more, something more. And that's the key to, like, God, God, God speaking to us. And I have seen so many people live, like here, in, the, in this, uh, something happened here. Uh, I don't know. I've seen so many people live here, and they can't get beyond this life, you know. And then as it crumbles, or they are troubled or disappointed, they kind of blame God. And they say, God didn't do this for me. They did it. I had a woman in our church whose son uh, uh, w w w didn't walk with God anymore. He came here to our school, and he kind of drifted away. And the mother said, I can't come because I see all these young people in the church. And it bothers me so much because I know my son should be here. My son would enjoy it. This is what my son needs. But I can't handle that. And, and so she stopped coming. Ironically, her son is back now. But she isn't, you know. Uh, so work on this for a second. Has it ever happened to you? Maybe what you had in mind, why well, it didn't happen. But what, what is God offering us? It's relationship. What, what he wants is relationship. I just believe that some of these things are ordained of God to get us to get beyond ourselves. And it's, it's tough, but you got to drop it. My, my son and his life, yeah, i got to drop it. My husband is a bad guy. I come, somehow, somehow I have to get beyond it. And I have to believe that God has something for me that will satisfy my heart, that will build me up, that will help me, that the anointing of God in my life. So that's it. Um, so could you, I don't know, you don't have to talk about it, but if you want for a minute, and then we'll go to the video. If you want to say something to your neighbor or explain it, you don't have to talk about yourself, but just say, this is how I understand the principle. Like, I wanted to become an actor like Avery, but it never happened. I wanted to become rich like Cody, but that didn't happen. I wanted to be happy like Josh, but it didn't happen. I wanted to be like great carpenter like Ryan over there. I wanted to be an IT guy like Victor. Didn't happen.
open your Bibles to Song of Solomon, chapter 3. This morning I'm going to preach a message entitled The Love Road for Relationships. We're going to get into a series of sermons on relationships extensively. I'll speak upon it tonight. A series of messages on relationships. Relationships are so crucial to understand what it means. Song of Solomon, chapter 3. Verse 10, Solomon made himself a chariot in verse 9. Verse 10, he made the pillars thereof of silver, the bottom thereof of gold, the covering of it of purple, in the midst thereof being paved with love for the daughters of Jerusalem. Now if you turn to Romans 5, please. The fifth chapter of Romans. All roads lead to Rome. Here we go. Romans. All right. Just a slip of the tongue. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we also have access. We have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. That's clear, isn't it? Wherein we stand. And rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And that's a very interesting phrase, especially for people like man of God who's been buried in legalism until we met him. Not only so, but we glory in tribulation, also knowing that tribulation worketh patience. Patience, experience. Experience, hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, which is given unto us. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. God commendeth his love toward us while we yet sinners. Christ died for us. Verse 8. And one more passage we want to give, Ephesians, the fourth chapter. And this is what it says. That you put off, verse 22, concerning the former conversation, the old sin nature, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. That you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Father, please bless each one today and, and bless this message in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. We want you to think with me this morning about the word relationships. First of all, a relationship, interrelationship, means to, from God's viewpoint, to relate intimately and to respond to each other and to be intimately involved in oneness or to conjugate, to be conjoined in oneness with each other's heart. Relationship. The world has been terribly lost to the true meaning of relationships. Their premise of initiation so often lacks the proper foundation. 
and the foundation to a God-given relationship is so crucial. In 1 Corinthians 3, the Word of God says there is no other foundation for a relationship but Jesus Christ. So it is very easy to see why relationships in their true meaning are so forfeited because the only foundation for a relationship is Jesus Christ. And this morning in the initiation of this series, we want to show you what Jesus Christ initiates to every person in his desire to have a tremendous relationship, wherein he initiates, the recipient responds, there's an intimacy, they are conjoined together in oneness, where there is a tremendous reflection of himself to them, and then they reflect his glory, which means his characteristics to him and others, to be in a true relationship. The first thing that God gives us as a model, as a pattern for our understanding is this. Solomon's chariot was made of wood from Lebanon. That was a very highly prized wood. And our humanity often in the Word of God speaks of wood for the analogy. The pillars upon that chariot, they were silver. And silver speaks of constant redemption and something that has been redeemed. But these were the pillars. There would be two pillars of certain saints written in Revelation 12 in heaven. Two summaries of the Christian salvation and what the Christian did with his life would be a second pillar written of believers, not just the apostles, in heaven in the New Jerusalem. But here we have this covering was purple. The foundation of the chariot was gold. But very interesting, it says that in the midst of it, the road was paved with love. So it takes it right into a spiritual reference. It says the road was paved with love for the daughters of Jerusalem who were outside of the bridegroom and the bride. We have in this story, the covering was purple. Purple always means in the scriptures, or practically always, the hypostatic union of Jesus Christ. The red, the blue, the blood of Jesus that he shed in his humanity, the blue, his heavenly deity, put together, and you have purple. Both God and both man, and separate from God because he was man, and separate from man because he was God. And beautifully enough, the covering for the chariot was purple. And our covering is the Lord Jesus Christ. His blood covers our sins. His deity has justified us because we have believed. The gold is our foundation, the sinlessness of God's character. And the silver is what he did to redeem us with his efficacious atonement on Calvary. Within this structure of verse 10 of Song of Solomon 3 are these very beautiful words. It says, in the midst thereof, I mean, you're talking about a chariot with wood from Lebanon. You're talking about silver pillars. You're talking about a gold bottom. You're talking about a purple covering. And it's for the, those that are outside of the intimacy of the relationship between the bride and the bridegroom. And then you have this picture. In the midst thereof, the road is paved with love. God 
starts a relationship for those outside of him, the daughters of Jerusalem, who did want to know him because he was so beautifully described by the one that was in love with him. And the love starts in with an entire road for those that we would consider to be unsaved. And the entire road is paved with God's love. Why? Because all of their sins have been paid for, but they have not cashed in on the benefit of salvation. They have not been saved. And this road paved with love is for every single recipient of his or her relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Interrelationship. Intimacy. Conjoined to oneness. A relationship that bears the fruit of a road paid all over with love. There is no legalism in it. It doesn't start out with do's and don'ts. It starts out with it has been done. It has been finished. And in this road paved with love, when the believer or when a person becomes saved, the first thing that happens to him is he's justified by grace through faith. And he enters into the justification of a new creature and a new creation. In Genesis 1.26, we were created in the image of God, but sin entered into the human race. And then our nature didn't reflect God, Adam and Eve's nature. It reflected self. It reflected fear, insecurity, paranoia, oversensitivity, guilt, fig leaves, a false covering, not the covering of purple. And for thousands of years, man has been plunging into the depth of introspection, the depth of being counsel, the depth of finding out why they feel the way they do, why they do the things they do, why their desires are what they are. And even though they may become religious with their fig leaves and do everything to correct the wrong, they still live in a fallen state, sublimating with drugs and liquor and sex and perversion or self-righteousness and pride and arrogance and relative righteousness, whichever the case may be. But, the Word of God says, we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand to the hope of the glory of God. And what does it mean? It is a precious verse. We've already been justified by grace through faith before God with all of his holiness in verse 1. And now by the faith that justified us, we have access into this grace, the grace that saved you when you were ungodly and you believed. Now you have access into this grace. Remember the road that brought you there is paved with love, redemption, the perfect life of Christ, the covering of a finished work, the purple covering your life, which pictures the chariot, what you live in, your body, all during your life down here, that that takes you places, your body, beyond your mind. Now, perfect, passive, indicative, we stand. Perfect tense. Something happened in the past.
past, passive voice, you received the grace from what happened. Indicative mood, dogmatically, you have received it forever. So you're standing in it with a perfect tense, which means forever. So if you're standing in it in a perfect passive indicative, what happens when you fall? In the Greek, it's a picture that under you, what you're standing in is totally the grace of God. The passive voice, you received it in salvation for your, for your eternal security. The indicative mood is you're dogmatically standing in it. So when you fail, you fall into grace. You don't fall from grace unless you deny it, reject it, and resist it. You fall into it. And as you fall into it, you have the option to rebound. You have the option of enjoying discipline if you reject it, but you have the privilege of being in grace while the discipline is going on. But there's another beautiful verse after it deals with tribulation and patience and experience and hope. It's the love of God is shed abroad. Perfect active. He started pouring it out on in your heart. Here's the road paved with love. When individuals will be filled with the Holy Spirit, when they have access to this grace by faith wherein they stand, the Holy Spirit is poured out inside of your heart. And what does that mean? It means the intimacy of a wonderful relationship with God. It means the road is paved with love. The mental attitude receives love. The conscience receives love. The self-conscious part of your soul receives love. Your emotions receive love. Not just receive it, but it's poured out. How? By grace that saved you, now pours it out within you in a road that is paved with love. In this beautiful principle, we learn the principle of Ephesians 4.22, having put off the old sin nature's dominance, which is corrupt according to its sinful nature, and being renewed, to be renewed, new in our quality of life, because of this road paved with love, because of this grace, what happens? To be renewed where? In the mind. And that's a perfect tense again with a passive voice. And this time it's an infinitive. And that means that we are constantly receiving the passive voice, the love of the Spirit shed abroad in our heart. We are receiving a new mind. And the newness takes place from the heart of love to the mind of our thoughts. So it goes from the love shed abroad in the hearts to become a brand new mind which is created after God in righteousness and true holiness and therefore put on that new man which is created after God in righteousness and true holiness. Therefore the Christian life is so unique for a person's self-esteem. And the most unique thing it does, it consistently erases the derogatory things that have happened outside of grace and outside of love. It eliminates the subjective garbage that people bring into a marriage the subjective waste of, of yesterday. 
How does it do it? Jesus is speaking to his own. And in John 15, 3, in the, the B part, he says, Now you are clean through the words that I have spoken unto you. I mean, that was before they, he knew they were going to fail him. But he wasn't dealing with a future failure coming up. He said, now you are clean, right now. They'd been cleansed by the words that he has spoken to them or had spoken to them. In Psalm 119, 9, they were cleansed. And in Acts 15, 9, they were purified. Hey, listen, they're going to fail, but they're clean, cleansed, and purified. Why and how? The road is paved with love. They're standing in grace. They have access to Jesus Christ. Their hope is the glory of God. What does that mean, glory of God? Their hope is that some new thing about love and some new revelation about grace and some new beautiful thing about the nature of God will be reflected in them. And that's what glory means, the nature of God reflected in us. It's kind of like 2 Corinthians 3.17. Wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, and that means the Lord of resurrection. The Lord that overcame sin, sins and death for us, as us, to give us resurrection life. And so the Bible says so beautifully that Jesus Christ and the, as the Lord of resurrection begins to minister to every single heart some aspect of his nature now. Let me illustrate it. For we all as a polished brass mirror Look into the glory of God. That means his nature, his characteristics, his essence, what he's made up of as God. We behold him. And the Bible says we are changed. We are converted right on the spot from glory to glory. That means that my impatience is changed into his patience. My insecurity is changed into his new image. My poor self-image is changed into a new self-image. My doubting is changed into faith with boldness and confidence. From glory to glory, as we behold him in the mirror of the word of God, we are changed from glory to glory into the same image. Oh, now we're getting the image back. No longer do I bear the image of a fallen man. Now I bear the image of a new man. No longer do I reveal the image of the old creation. Now we reveal the image of the new creation. No longer are we under the bondage of an old covenant of do's and don'ts. Now we're under the liberty not as an occasion for the flesh in Galatians 5.13, but under the liberty to be changed, to be renewed, to be special people, members of the royal family of God, with all the dignity of being kings and priests as individuals before our Lord Jesus Christ. And now we walk around with the privilege of the highest kind of dignity in Satan's territory known to man, revealing the image of God's nature through our humanity in situations and details in which Satan is permitted to tempt us and approach us and seduce us and harass us and lie to us and accuse us and attack our new creation image with Christ. What does this mean? It means that now we are the sons and daughters of God. And it means in Psalm 32 and verse 10 that he that trusteth in the Lord, mercy shall encompass him everywhere. 
And I looked up the word compass and encompass in the Hebrew, and it says, a circle around the saint. Now picture this. My road is paved with love. But I'm standing in the pure, unadulterated grace of God. So if I don't fall into it and God helps us not to and gives us victory and keeps us from doing that through his word and through our fellowship with him, then if I go to the right, go to the left, fall forward, fall backward, mercy surrounds us. This is why this is called a great salvation. This is why the nature of God must not be misunderstood. This is so good that that grace teaches us to love righteousness, to hate iniquity, and to be exalted above our fellows with the oil of the gladness. This is so good that I can come face to face in my heart with God and know that he will meet the needs of individuals and meet the needs of pains and sorrows and heartaches and finances and cars and health and emotions, that he'll meet the needs that, that Satan has often caused or wrong decisions has produced. This road is paved with love and therefore it constrains us and motivates us because we thus judge that one died for all and we're all dead with Christ. And henceforth, we do not live unto ourselves, but unto a God of resurrection who raised Jesus from the dead. Therefore, our relationships are not centered with talking about the flesh. We don't know each other after the old sin nature. Oh, we all have it. But we don't know each other after the old sin nature. Not even Jesus, who was numbered with us as a transgressor for us. No, we don't but we're in Christ and therefore as members of this new creation with all things that are passed away and all things become new, we begin to see God in a brand new light. We see him as a clean people. We see him as a cleansed people. And if we fail, we name it and recover quickly. We see him with the mercies new every morning and compassions that fail not. We see him from our position in Christ. We see him from our position above. We see him standing as we stand in grace. We see him from a road that's paved with love at all times. We see him with mercy encompass us all around us. We see him as somebody who's being changed into his own image. And so we represent his very image. And that's why when sin comes into our life, the Holy Spirit convicts us that it's been paid for. He convicts us that it breaks fellowship. He convicts us that the road is paved with love. He convicts us that he wants us back in fellowship again. And so we say yes to that sin that was already paid for by the court of heaven on Calvary on Christ. This gives every single child of God not only hope, but hope to be just like Christ in reflecting his nature and reflecting his joy, his peace, his long suffering, in reflecting his gentleness, in reflecting his meekness. And when we are God conscious in meekness, and when we submit to the God consciousness in humility, the Holy Spirit teaches us and the meekness of God consciousness receives the word of God and it enters into the memory center and it floods the conscious mind and the subconscious mind through the operation of the Holy Spirit. And then the Spirit takes it and brings it into memory. And all of a sudden we realize that this Christian life does mean trusting. It does mean abiding. And it does mean experiencing Christ.
and we begin to understand that for us to live is totally Christ and to die is gain. Is it any wonder that our mouth is filled with praise, our hearts with thanksgiving, and our faith is absolutely true toward every promise of God? I wrote ten things this morning, and I am confident without any question that every one of those ten things will be answered. And I can say thank God for each one and not strive nor be anxious because our God has given us a road paved with love as we stand in grace surrounded by mercy and kept by the power of God in 1 Peter 1, 5. And therefore being conformed to his image with all things, we say in unity, united in our hearts, thank you, thank you, thank you. Would you stand? Okay, you can uh, take your break now uh, for 10 minutes. You can talk about these things that you heard, and then we'll come back and discuss the class a little bit. All right, so take 10 minutes and come on back, please.
Okay. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, if I could have your attention, uh, just a quick announcement from the Student Council. First of all, I want to introduce the um, new Bible College dress code. Okay? We've got to bring it back. We've gotten too lazy. We've got to wear ties. Come on, guys. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. You're good. You're good. You're good. I'm not. <laughs> yes, they're out of order. Um, just a couple quick announcements. So we've got a sign-up sheet out there uh, in front of the Bible College um, reception desk for the Texas trip, tentative Texas trip, leaning towards definite green light. We're just organizing some things out with the um, with Pastor Chris Moore down in Texas to do that. So that'll likely happen on the dates are on there, all the information's on there. That'll likely happen June 7th that weekend. Thinking about leaving on Friday and the time we'd leave is kind of up for up for debate, up for, you know, discussion. Um, so if we'd leave on Friday though, come back on we'd fly back on Monday. So the the plan would be to fly to Texas to visit Pastor Chris Moore's church. Um, so if you're seriously interested, it is a little bit of a financial commitment, like $300, $400, dollars, depending on what flights we can get, and then also like what in, you know food and other expenses might come along the way for that trip. But roughly $300, $400, hopefully that's a conservative estimate. Um, so if you are seriously interested and you you know you you could think you know pray about it and, and feel like you could you could do this trip, please do put your name on that sheet because we want to get an idea for how many people are going to be interested what kind of, um, how we could coordinate, you know, buying tickets together, doing it together where we could all fly together or at least have groups fly together um, and also make it easy for them to know how many people are going to be going. So that's that. The second thing is we are planning, the student council is, is trying to plan like kind of a brochure yearbook. We have Hannah who's um, in our in our student council and she has the ability because she helps out in the missions office with like wings of glory and those kind of prayer focuses and stuff that they print out and so we were we had the idea to do a kind of a, not a traditional yearbook but something in the middle where it's like you know a, pa a pamphlet you open up you see the students and maybe quotes and kind of stuff like that so we need your help though so if you're interested in kind of participating in that that would be really helpful for us, like doing an article or, or some sort of like, you know, maybe you interview Pastor Schaller or Pastor Steve or a teacher, or you're in a class and you want to talk about that. Just something, anything. The, the world's our oyster kind of as far as that goes. So if you're interested in doing something, anything, just find myself, maybe Hannah or anybody on the student council, Jesse, Alina, um, Bella, Jonathan Mikkonen, who am I missing, Ryan Horton, any of these people. You can just reach out and just say, "Hey, I'm, I heard about that yearbook thing that you know we're doing. Is that something I could help with?" Um, and we'll we'll talk about that. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Okay. All right. So we're gonna speak and teach about the relationship now in this part of the class. I said earlier we would look at the book of Habakkuk. Maybe we will do that. So I'm not sure if this what what I what I have now in my my mind is Job one. So I wanna I think this is the go to text for relationship. And of course we know what relationships are between people and we have like maybe surface what you could call service relationships and normal relationships working relationships 
acquaintances, what are some words? Acquaintances with people, um, friendships, uh, what, what you, you understand that, right? So we know a lot of people, like look around in the room and categorize your relationships with the people that are in the room. Okay, that one, I don't know his name. Okay, that lady, I don't I never talk to her, uh, you know, uh, and that kind of thing. All right, so have fun for a second. Categorize people. Orioles fan, New York fan. Okay, baseball. Okay, all right, now go to the screen, go to the screen, and we know that Jesus said, you follow me because of the food, okay? And we could answer Jesus, you know, of course, that's why we're with you, you know, you give out free lunches, you give out like, like dollar bill, hundred dollar bills, of course. Rice Christians. What's Rice Christians in missions? Anybody know? Rice Christians, Pat, Andrew? Uh, they expect, uh, go, they expect, yes. It was a term used in China that the missionaries, like Chinese, would become Christians because they would get rice. The missionaries would give them rice. And so the, the Chinese would say, yeah, I'm a Christian. And they would get the rice, and they were called rice Christians. That's like on our diagram of the first level of the house. We follow you because of the food. Now, what's wrong with that? Why not? Why, why, what's wrong with the relationship? How about your mom and dad? You know, you could say, mom and dad, they pay my bills. They, they provide me with video games. I get movies, I get a house, I get the heat and everything. And that's my relationship with my mom and dad. Are your, is your mom and dad satisfied with that relationship? How about it? No? Come on, talk back to me. Why are you quiet all of a sudden? Because you're rice Christians, I know you are. That's why. Okay, so what's wrong? What's, what's up? What what is it? What what's the what are we looking for? Yes. Yeah. Like that's one side because yeah. person is giving something, but if they don't do it anymore, you still gonna have a relationship with that person? Yeah, right. When the food is over, where's the relationship go? Right? So so when the food is over, what do I have? What I have. Now listen to me. This is amazing. Who said this? Who said to God that when the food is over, the relationship isn't there? Yeah, Satan said it. Satan said that to God. God, the reason why Job is worshiping you is because you're taking care of him. When you stop doing that, it's over. He doesn't know. He has no relationship with you. He, he, he's an empty suit. He's an empty guy. He doesn't have a relationship with you. Like only you take care of him and then he worships you. But the minute you, you turn the spout off, your game over. You don't have him. He don't have him. He doesn't, he doesn't love you. He doesn't know you. Okay. So there, there it is. That's the end of the class. Go home in Jesus' name. Come on. <laughs> Go home now. Yeah. Wow, this is pretty good, huh? Let's read it. Job, Job chapter 1, <clears throat> verses 6 to 12. 
Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And of course, uh, that, that you can meditate on that text your whole life. It's so fascinating. I really believe it. Do you know what? Do you know who? When Jesus said, Jesus said something to Peter, and he said, "What? Satan has desired to have you." And then read this. Like Satan came before God, and God said, "Do you know my?" And Satan said, "Let me have him." Let me have him. I wonder if Satan said that to God about Peter. We don't know. But Satan could have said, I want Peter. I know who he is. He's one of these food guys. You know, you take care of Peter, you know, and, and but if you, I can get him to deny you. I can get him to go away from you. I can do that. Satan could say that to God. And, and Jesus said, but I have prayed for you. And when you are converted, strengthen the brethren, right? Which is saying there is this re relationship here. And when you are converted, you tell people that you can actually know Christ and you can live another way, even with a bad husband, even with a bad country, a bad economy, even in a bad tier period of time, and of course, you know where way life can go. Who who knows? No, none of us know what tomorrow will bring. Okay. Uh, verse <clears throat> seven, and the Lord said unto Satan, Where do you come from? Whence comest thou? And why isn't that a good statement? Where are you coming from? Huh? I, we had a new person come to the church. They came in. I go, where are you coming from? Where are you coming from? They said, from wandering through the earth, going to and fro. I go, that sounds like the devil. <laughs> Verse 7. And, and he said, from going to and fro from the earth and walking up and down in it. Why is he moving around? I, I collect the information. I think because he doesn't have a home. He doesn't have a home. He doesn't have a place. Like he's a wanderer. He's a schemer. He's mischievous. He's evil. He is looking to whom he can devour. He feeds on us. He'd love to destroy us. Love to deceive us. Love to murder us. Love to destroy us. Verse um, 8. The Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? And Job could say, Don't say that. Have you considered my servant? Don't throw me to the wolves. Like, don't provoke the devil. He will come after. Yeah. Have you considered my servant Job? Huh? Uh, that there is none like him in the earth. Nothing like setting him up as a target. Putting the bullseye on his t-shirt. There, Job. A perfect and upright man, one that fears God and eschews evil. There's a good picture of the upper story of the house. Like how much does Job know God? How much does he know God, you know, right? And uh, just for all of you to know, and I do believe you know this, that when you give your life to Christ, yeah, that's, the, that's, the, that's what you want. And you got to learn to kind of set your eyes, you know, if you like think about it. It's like you got to kind of develop a way of thinking where you're not saying what I need is uh, a better life, a husband, what I need is a long life, what I need is to be beautiful, what I need is to be smart, what I need is a good job, what I need is a good family, what I need is prosperity. You have to guard yourself from those things. 
and that's Proverbs uh, not, uh, 30. You want to flip here and read that for a moment. I, I think I'm going to have you, Pastor Steve, jump in to say one thing about Timothy Keller's message. So Proverbs 30, verse 7 and 8 and 9. I would like you to make a note of these verses because I think they're going to speak to your heart. Two things that I required of you, deny me them not before I die. Refu remove far from me vanity and lies. That's one. That's the primary thing. Vanity and lies. And they are in two areas. Like verse 8 is, you can break it down. This is a good message for you guys uh, and ladies. You could teach in a, in a class or share something. In, in, in seven minutes, you can teach this, and it's, it, it's beautiful. Remove far from me vanity and lies. So there's two kinds of way, ways I could get, I could get tricked. And that is verse 8, give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me. So, so there's, like, we have a tendency of, like, we, we could say, to use this um, picture, we have food and then we have no food. I'll put here food plus plus, plus, like riches. Don't give me too much, and then don't give me too little. What, what happens if I get too much lies? There's lies that come into my heart. How, how come I have so much? Because I, I deserve it. I earned it, or I'm smart. How come I have too much? How, much, how, come, do I have, how come I have too little? Poverty. I have poverty. Why, why do I have poverty? I am not smart enough. I am weak. I'm not a good human being. I can't manage my own stuff. Lies come with both of those. When you have riches, you have lies, and when you have poverty, you have lies. But he said, help me, Lord, a answer my prayer, because he s explains it in verse 9. If I am full and deny you and say, who is the Lord, or I be poor and steal and take the name of my God in vain. Okay, so there's a benefit of, of going to, living in the whole house, like in the whole house. So I have my, my food, but I have God, and I have God that's helping me manage my food my practical life. I've, I've God helping me. You know, my marriage, let's say my mar marriage isn't good, but I've got God helping me to understand how I should live my life with my, my problem. Okay? But I don't want to deny God. That's the key here. And that's the story of Job. Like, Job, what are you going to do when you lose everything? So go back to Job Chapter one. Did you, Pastor Steve? Did did you want to say anything? I think. Okay. Yeah, you could do it now. What? Yeah, I think I just said it, but but um. they they don't mind hearing it again, <laughs> <laughs> or whatever's on your heart. <laughs> but it was a Timothy Keller point. Well, yeah, I just uh, you know. Um, Like Job is in uh, Job is an example of adversity, and uh, like Pastor made the point, like the devil is given opportunity or influence, you know, because he's basically challenging the character of the relationship between God and Job, like this. This relationship. Now, Pastor Stevens is talking about us living on a road paved with love. Uh, we fall into grace. We are surrounded by grace. 
and will Job live in that? So, uh, you know, there's, there's two testing grounds, really. Um, Timothy Keller makes this point in the message on Proverbs, two testing grounds. One is like prosperity. When you have a lot, you know, you can feel like you've earned it and you deserve it. And you also can become very, um, what is it, very overconfident. Like, you know, you, you think I've got a lot and then you start thinking like I have big success and then I actually, I actually know everything. You know, you can step into that kind of thing. And then in adversity, like Pastor mentioned, the person who blames God because the marriage didn't work out. It's like, now I want you to notice that um, Job is like a real object lesson for us in the books of wisdom. It comes first before we get to the Psalms. It's like, this is a question that maybe the Hebrew people asked Moses, like, why did God allow us to be in slavery for 400 years? It's like, it just seems like, why would he do that? And, uh, you know, and, and then this story was told, I think, during those days to say, you know, there is a devil and, uh, you know, actually the, the uh, challenges that you face are really uh, designed to bring you, draw you closer to God. And to also uh, allow you to, like, make those kind of questions to God. I think that's the great thing. Like, how can you talk to God? You can talk to God very strongly and emotionally. And Job just like spills his guts. You know, he's got these guys telling him things that aren't right, and then he just spills his guts. But he really clings to that idea that um, I have a Redeemer who lives, and I shall see him at the last day. It's like that's, you know, uh, just a thread of hope can like keep you in those kinds of situations and like you know the devil uh, is active and the world is broken and good things happen to bad people and bad things happen to seemingly good people and the question is like do you know your redeemer lives it's like that's the secret to it like do you know the redeemer lives and what's your relationship to the lord do you see those those things that pastor stevens talked about present passive, indicative, and infinitive. Those are all like grammatical terms. Uh, but like the present tense, you have a standing in the grace of God. You are bought with the price. You didn't do anything to receive it. You passively received it. God said, here. You said, thank you. That's all you did. And then it's a dogmatic indicative. It's, it's your identity now. And then the infinitive part of it, it's forever. So when you fall into the, when you find yourself into these challenges that the devil stirs up around you, do you think of yourself as having a redeemer and that you will see him in a certain point in time? That's what kept Job, I think, through the whole story is that, and he doesn't, he says a lot, a lot, a lot of negative things. And it's true. We do way more complaining than praising and thanking God. And that's just the nature of all humans. And if you are different from that, I think you're lying. You know, I do way more complaining to God, but that's the good thing is I've learned to complain more to God in my car by myself than to complain in front of people. You know, but I know my Redeemer lives, you know, so is that good? That's great. Know. Yeah, it's so. good. Yeah. 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 When you were, you were talking about the finished work, I, I wanted to make... I want to emphasize one thing about our diagram. When you receive Christ, automatically you have access to the whole house, you know. When you receive Christ, you have it. You are a new creation. You died with him. You were raised with him. That's your status. The sad thing is that we, in our own mind, without the mind being renewed, we gravitate to the first floor and we say, you know, if you love me, God, you would give me this and then give me this. But the finished work is the orientation that you have, you know, by being a Bible believer and being taught the doctrine that establishes you so that when your world collapses, you don't. And that's like the book of Job. And the devil says, you know, th this isn't real, God. I know that, and you know that, that this guy, 
is only loving you because of what you're doing for him. All right, so let's read that. It's chapter 1, verse um, 9. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? Hast not thou made a hedge about him and about his house and about all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. Like, but, but, and you could say, who wouldn't love you? If that's the deal that you got, you got. It's like your teenager loving mom and dad because, but with you, when you, you know, and and that that relationship isn't the relationship that actually we are. We know in our hearts that we want a deeper one, and that deeper one is. There's a few words here that we could we could put up that are very important, like a relationship where there is trust. There is a relationship where there is loyalty. Now, uh, <clears throat> I was reading this book today for this class. Oh, I didn't bring it. It's called Loyalty. Um, maybe, maybe you could... You know, no, I think the author, his name is Sorge. Is it? Sorge. If you want to read, it's very good. Loyalty. Okay, trust. Uh, why? Why? How do we know that God wants relationship and that he wants a relationship that will endure and a relationship that can can survive. How do we know this? Because in the Trinity, this is the essence of God is relationship. You've got three, three persons, and in the relationship of God with himself, there is trust and there is loyalty. Why, how do we know this? Because when Christ came, uh, Christ came and his whole life was based on the Father. And when he is mistreated and even forsaken by the Father, in Psalm 22, verse 1, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Verse 4, But our fathers trusted in you and you delivered them. So Jesus went through the whole thing trusting. Then he's highly exalted and is our Savior, and is going to inherit the whole universe, for he has made all things, but then he will he's the heir of all things, in Hebrews 1 and verse 2. So there's the evidence there, and that we have in our Bible the whole story of, mis, of, of betrayal and of sin. So there we have um, Satan is, a, is at the other side of it, so we have God on one side, in this um, reality, we have God on one side, and then we have the anti-God elements. And what is the essence of the anti-God? We have Satan, who was an angel who, who fell, and you have the first Adam who sinned. So that's it. And when you look in human history, if you can find in history the loyalty and the trust that's in the nature of God, then you have remarkable people. And you go, why, why is that guy, why is that guy such an, or, or woman, why, why, what do they have? And you have, well, what they have is they have God, the nature of God in the whole house. Why isn't he stealing? Why isn't he lying? Why isn't he cheating? Because Jesus came and gave us his nature, and that righteousness is what has changed our lives. And the funny thing is, we all know that we're not really <laughs> that loyal, and we're not that dependable, we're not that great. And actually, we kind of live knowing that, you know, I could, 
you know, any at any moment I could be something less than what Jesus made made us to be. Sinning. Okay? So isn't that an amazing way of looking at life? It's like these two elements to be, you know, I think you can really break it down to this. This is Christ and God. Um, okay. God, Christ, the, the second Adam, and then, then Job, you could put here his name, and you could put down your name, you, and you could say, it, there, it's very possible that, that, that I have this in my heart. When, when I get angry with God, I just realize that's my flesh, and I know what that is. It's the anti-God spirit that is in the world. And I, I know I know that uh, I'm capable of that. Okay, uh, let's look at uh, Job one verse um, eleven. Uh, but put forth your hand now and touch all that he has, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power, and only. Upon himself, put not forth thine hand, so Satan. So you can't, you can't kill him. Or in the in the next part, it is you, you can, you can touch him. Here, you can't touch his body, like with a disease. But in the next phase, you can touch his body with a disease, but you can't kill him. Fascinating text, isn't it? Can Satan kill somebody? Apparently, and Paul said it. He said, "I've turned over that. I've turned that person over to Satan to destroy his flesh." In First Corinthians five, you know, so it could be that he would be a tool. But death and life is in the hand of God. But God could take his hand off, so to speak, and Satan could take somebody's life. But of course, ultimately, it's God that does it. Pretty scary. You know, amazing, actually. All right, so then, um, uh, yeah, maybe maybe we'll we'll stop there for a second and um, just uh, just maybe ask your neighbor: Do we have a do we have a question that we want to ask Pastor Steve or Pastor Schaller? So, between yourselves, just see: Do you have a question? Okay, um, we'll take a couple questions, a question or two maybe. All right, here's one, one thing to observe about this. Uh, turn to Psalm 62 for... Uh, text here, chapter 62, verse 5. Uh, five. And six, my soul, wait thou only upon God, for my expectation is from him. So sometimes you have to, I remember when I went to Bible college, the people would say to me, what are you going to get out of this? What is your education? What, what are you going to get? Are you going to get a job? I said, I don't know. Uh, when we went as missionaries to Finland, what are you doing handing out papers on the street? What do you expect to get from this? What's gonna, what are you going to do? What are you doing? What do you, I don't know. I didn't know. And I mean, in a way, it's still today. Like, what do you know about your future? And where will you end up? And what will happen? Here it says, 
my expectation is from God. Okay? That's a very interesting thing. That means some expectation is more like from myself and from, you know, things or my expectation is food, you know. I want the food is or um this or that, you know, but I think you and I have already done that. We've already lived with an expectation that comes from the world. And, like, I don't think it really is that great what they offer. I would like my expectation to be from God. And then the next thing it says in verse 6, He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. Okay, so that's that's very powerful statement. I will not be moved. Wait a minute. Life is always about moving. Everybody's moving, tossed to and fro. Everything is changing. You will not be moved. No, I will not be moved. That's what he said. My expectation is from God. I will not be moved. But then he changes it a little bit later in the psalm. He says in verse, um, uh, where are we? Uh, Where are we? I'm sorry. Oh, uh, verse 2. He only, I thought it was later. He only is my rock and my soul. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. That's like how he started it. I'll not be greatly moved. And then he says, I will not be moved. I, mean, I, I don't want to say much about that, but only make a point of it. That there are, I think that both are, are both it happens to us in life. Like, I am moved, but not greatly, because I will always come back. You know, once you have tasted this, like, so to speak, you know about the house, kind of. You know about it in your heart and in your experience, and you have tasted this, then you can always go back to it and say, Lord, I have left you. I am back. And the Lord says, you are moved a little bit, but not greatly moved because you come back to me. You come back to me. You're not greatly moved, but you are not moved. You, you are not moved. There's that part of it, and then not greatly moved, okay? So I would like, and in Bible college, I mean, this is in my heart, and I know we all think like that I want people to experience God in their hearts. And know him this way. And then set your affection there. And then you will not be greatly moved. Will you get upset? Yes. Will you maybe even lose your faith for a while? Yeah, that could happen. Will you get troubled? Will you get frustrated? Will you get angry? Will you go kicking and fussing? And something like that, like Job did. Like Job, it wasn't a smooth ride. But he ultimately found that God is awesome and God is real. And I am, I've been foolish. There's another, that's Psalm 73, when he kind of woke up and real, re got, realized how foolish he was envying rich people and envying so, uh, successful people. But get, get your calibration, get your bearings based on the relationship that you have with God. But, but lastly, God loves your relationship with him. It gives him honor and glory. God loves you. God loves the fact that you can trust him. God lo loves you. He gave his son for you. Like he's never against you, never forsaking you. And he knows that as sinful people, we, we need th this uh, house here. This one, yeah, this house, we do get messed up there. We do get messed up. Of course we do. We're human beings. You know, we do really do need food. When you take the food away, I'm going to be kicking and fussing about it. Like, where is God? You know what I mean? 
or you're in trouble in the hospital and you're struggling to survive. Where is God? Of course. Like he knows, this is our, our calling in life. But uh, give yourself a lot of grace. Know that God is for you and the relationship he has with you. You cannot destroy that relationship because it's finished work. You cannot destroy your relationship with God in the sense of it being imputed to you that you're legally favored, you are legally honored, you are righteous, you're going to heaven. It's just don't forfeit the experience of living a life of faith and finding him as your sufficiency. Amen? Okay, Pastor Steve, did you want to say anything? Okay, so uh, you promised Habakkuk. So I'm going to say that you guys should read Habakkuk this week uh, because at the beginning it's the prophet like saying, how long do I have to watch these things? How long do I have to watch these things? But at the end, he gets a song. And at the very end of the song, he says, at the very end of the song, that's the last chapter, it says, though, um, though the fig tree shall not blossom, though there be no grapes upon the vine, though the olive tree has cast its fruit, Though there be no cattle in the stall, yet I will still see the Lord as my joy and strength, and by His grace, He'll change it all. So I think like you can train yourself to be heavenly minded and think that there is something, there is an upper floor. You have to look, you have to decide that there's an upper floor to life. And uh, maybe you don't see the stairs so much, but you have to decide that there's an upper floor. Even though like all these things, Habakkuk gets to the end of it and he says, okay, I am going to worship the Lord. I decide that I'm going to worship the Lord, that I believe that there is something coming. I'm not going to curse you to your face, even though everything has been wasted in my life. I'm still going to be, you're going to be my joy and strength because I believe what you've said. And so, you know, we can renew our minds that way, talk to God that way, ask the Holy Spirit to shed the love for him abroad in our hearts. And uh, then we'll be like, we'll change cities that way. We'll change our own lives first, and then we'll change cities that way. So there you go. We got to Habakkuk anyway. How about that? There you go. All right. You guys good? All right. Uh, all right. Let's, uh, Pastor Chris is back there. Great message last night. Uh, the the, the goobalaloobalas, what are they called? <laughs> that was good. <laughs> yeah, also the witch doctors. That's right. All right. Amazing. That's right. All right, Lord, thank you for tonight. We pray, Lord Jesus, that we would uh, see you high and lifted up in our hearts. And uh, that we would be like, yeah, you would touch us. You touch us with something from heaven when we see you high and lifted up. We are undone people. We are unclean people. But you have touched us with something from heaven. That's the finished work. That's what we have in our lives that can never be taken from us. And help us to rehearse that in our mind and to live in the upper floor a lot close to you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thanks, guys. Have a good night. God bless.